Hey, thanks for uh, listening in on another episode of Triple Play. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And we just want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Brooks Bible College. Don't forget to check out Brooks Bible College. If you're looking for a good degree uh, in, in the Midwest or you just want to come to the Midwest, good place to visit here in St. Louis, check out Brooks Bible College. We'll have all their information in the show notes. Uh, we like them and love them and uh, hope you check them out. That said, we have a great guest today. Returning guest? Returning guest, yes. You were here before talking about Camp Penuel, but while you were here, we got to talking at that time about your end times, and you know, you kind of were drawn to to Camp Penuel because of some end time stuff. You really, uh, Joy's uh, dad had written uh, uh, some end times material, and then it comes out that you just published or were getting ready to publish your first uh, our book right. um, on it, and so we are we've got it right here, exposing the Antichrist, a fresh look at who he is. So my first question is: Is how'd you get in? How'd you get into end times? You know, was it just something that you found fascinating, or was it something that you just started studying to do a sermon and it really pulled you in? What what kind of brought your fascination to well, thinking about end times? You know, right? I think you know, as we when we're born again, I believe the Lord puts gifts in us, and um, I had a gift for teaching, and I grew up in a church where it was a lot of preaching. There was. I had a good pastor who could teach, but he preached his teaching. And so it made me hungry for God's word. And in that, I was 14 years old and God called me to preach. I began to preach at 14. And I got a hold of Joy's dad's book called Revelation for the Layman. And I had a hunger for the end times because my pastor taught end times and was very strong teacher about that. But I, when I read Harry's book about Revelation, I began to study it and want to learn more about Revelation. And it just got me excited about uh, end times. And boy, that's been uh, 45 years uh, of studying. Now, I, I study everything, but when I was in high school, I finally, one of my pastor friends who was a teacher said, Larry, you know, there's other stuff besides the end times. And, <laughs> and I said... Yeah, you're right. And he, and so I had determined in my heart to study other things too. And uh, so over the years, I would come back to this teaching. And it wasn't until in my 40s that I taught uh, the, the larger series on the on the uh, the rapture of the church, which was 42 lessons in my church. And so it was very expansive. And I got into more of the details of the things that I wanted to learn and and expand on. Uh, I've, you know, I've met guys who have preached the end times over the years. One was a um, great man of God. He was at a church in Indiana when I was uh, visiting there, church where I was ordained at first. And um, the Lord impressed on my heart that I would probably, that uh, I, I want to, it had to be some emotion there, but I felt like I was going to be his replacement in teaching the end times. And I don't want to say who that is because a lot of people know who that was, but I snuck a little note to him and, and as, so as much as to say, I, I think I'm called to be your replacement. And he was, he died the next year. Mm. And so I knew he was, it was going to be close to his time of leaving us, but uh, I don't know. We'll see what God has in mind as far as uh, our books and things that will go out and, and, uh, Maybe be a blessing to folks teaching the end times, but it started with Harry. It started with start with Harry. Okay, you know, it's kind of amazing. Well, and then you have end times is a big undertaking. I mean, you can take it a hundred different ways, mm -hmm. but you started out, which I really thought was interesting, exposing the Antichrist. Talking, let's narrow down this big thing. Let's come down to a little bit more narrow. Who's our? And I look at it as like. Who's our enemy? You know, Who, who's this guy that's going to become, that's going to come out, and what are what are what are going to be the things that help it's identify traits, him? Yeah, traits and things like that. And so, um, I have to admit, I have not read the book all the way yet. I started a little bit. My daughter was peeking into it, as I said earlier when we were talking. But uh, uh, but as I started, just kind of glancing over it, I mean, this is pretty in depth of all the different verses that go through and and depict what the Antichrist is, and even goes outside of some normal church literature to uh, supporting documentation out there and and uh, uh so you, you you didn't just 
stay within just the Bible itself, but some of the supporting docs that have been used over the years right. um, in support of the of the scriptures uh, you you will go out to. So what what made you want to narrow your focus to, to focusing on the antichrist versus you know you could have picked like the the thousand year reign you could have talked about the new heaven new earth you could have talked about you know what's going to look like when christ comes back i mean there's a whole slew of different things you could have picked but you you you, you narrowed it down to expose an antichrist is kind of your first step sure what made you kind of think that way in 2020 i was in the hospital with covid and had double pneumonia two types. Uh, one was COVID and the other was uh, bacterial pneumonia. And, and uh, the Lord, I already knew that I was going to survive that. A lot of people were praying for me, but mm -hmm. during that time, this study came to my heart. I had three of them that came to my mind. Now, I've taught a lot of series on end times and different aspects of it. And uh, this one here, I just want to do a little study on, on the Antichrist because there's so much about him in Scripture. Not sure where it started. I just got it during that time, just started studying it out. And it became so vast that I found so many verses. Somebody said there's over 100 passages about the Antichrist. If that's true, then shouldn't we pay attention to them? Shouldn't there be a study about them? And so, I started detailing it, and, and my book became one chapter after another, and and it was very rough, and I sent it off to uh, my dean of where I went to school. He said, Larry, this is a hard read, <laughs> and he suggested some things that I do, and I did. The first chapter was because of him. He said, explain your position first, and then go to the, the details of the Antichrist. So, what's your position when you when you say explain it in the first chapter? Well, I'm, I'm pre-trib, and I'm pre-millennial, so I believe that much of Daniel's future and Revelation is future. I believe some of it has been fulfilled. In fact, a lot of it has been fulfilled. And we need to understand the difference between the two and where those those uh, chapters teach those things. Um, and so, with that, I believe in the tribulation. I know that there's a future tribulation period. Daniel teaches that. And why is there a tribulation? And well, who's it for? All of that needs to be understood. It's in the first chapter here. And so, I believe the there's a, a last seven years that needs to be fulfilled for the people of Israel, according to Daniel 9, 27. This is a time when the Antichrist will come to bring peace and make a treaty with, the Bible says, with many. So, it's not just with Israel. What we're seeing today is an uprising against Israel, but I, this very well could be a season where we see somebody rise up and say, let's make peace and with that comes this seven-year treaty. They've already proposed it. There is a seven-year treaty already proposed out there. Um, in the middle of that, according to the Bible, according to Daniel, he'll break that covenant. And so, uh, that's where I wanted to get a better understanding of that. And so, I started studying Daniel, and then it became a study about the Antichrist and the details about him. There, I found 38 names that the Antichrist is called in Scripture. Mm. 38 different names, and there perhaps are, are more than I found. Um, so, what I did is each place I looked at those passages, I outlined them to say, this: if this is true, if this is about the Antichrist, these are the points that describe him. And with that, geez, I think I came up with, let me see here. But I was told like eight years ago or 10 years ago that the Antichrist was uh, Obama. Yeah. I'm joking. <laughs> I know. I've, I've heard it all. Believe me. When I, when I, I heard, heard it was Trump. There's many yeah. Antichrists, right? Yeah. And there has been, yeah. I believe in every generation there's an Antichrist ready. Uh, I don't believe we'll know, the church will know his name mm. because we'll go before he's revealed. Uh, I, I honestly believe that. And the full revealing of him is in the middle of the tribulation uh, because that's where he goes into the temple, sits on the mercy seat and says, I'm God. Mm -hmm. I'm not a Messiah. I'm not a, a good guy. I'm not a religious guy. I am God himself. And so, that's when we know he's fully revealed in who he is, according to Second Thessalonians 2. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, trying to name names, that's... I'm joking. I was just joking oh, about that because every everybody always seems like every time we get a, oh, yeah. a, a new president, it's that, that immediately goes to... Oh, he's he's the Antichrist. He's going to be the guy that that ends it all for us, right? Like the world's going to end if this guy is elected. And uh, you know that's where the sensationalism comes from. Is everybody wants to name a name? I have two hundred and eighty six facts about the Antichrist from these 
these uh, scriptures. I found another one the other day, so it'd be 287. But it isn't about trying to figure out the name as much as figuring out his personality, where he comes from, who he is in personage, what he does. And when you see that, you see how evil of a person he is. I would say Hitler was a type of an antichrist, um, but he, he did not come from the right place. So, he couldn't fulfill the biblical antichrist. Uh, the closest thing we've had in our lifetime would be Saddam Hussein. He came from Iraq. Um, he wanted to rebuild Babylon. He called himself the, the uh, reincarnated, um, who was it, Nebuchadnezzar? Not, no, mm. was it Cyrus? I think it was Cyrus the Great. So, um, the Persian king. So, uh, he was the closest. And then, of course, America came in and stopped him very quickly uh, from doing anything. But you'll find that he's called, the Antichrist in Scripture is called the Assyrian. He's called the Babylonian. He's called the wicked. Um, John called him the Antichrist. That was not a common name for him. So, we've adapted it because of church teaching to call him the Antichrist, but a, probably a more popular name in Scripture would be the Wicked One, or the Wicked, hmm. um, or the Assyrian, which is another name for it. Would you say a, a big misconception of the Antichrist is that he'll be um, apparently evil? Like they're like oh no, yeah, not at first. people are gonna yeah, think not at he's, first. He will be. And that's why everybody said Obama, which I don't believe he's Obama, but he will be such a character that's charismatic, well-liked. Mm -hmm. The Bible says he'll come up uh, in a way that is, um, he's among 10, he's the 11th among 10, and he comes up like Antiochus Epiphanes did with flatteries and uh, shaking the right hands, doing the right things. Very popular with both uh, Islamic people and European people. He'll he'll be well liked across the border, and um, and that's not you know, even to say that they'll be he'll be liked by the people of maybe a nation. So correct. I'm thinking correct. like I'm just thinking Trump on his last tour. Like everybody in the Middle East was shaking his hands, oh, loving yeah. him. The Jewish people, every like Russian, everybody loved Trump. Kim, yeah. but that's not to say that the people of those kings would like him. All of them. True. In fact, Initially. Scripture says there are some that will not uh, be under his rule. Mainly, uh, the Scripture points out that uh, the th three parts of Jordan will not be under his rule. Isn't that weird? Mm. If he's Middle Eastern, why wouldn't Jordan be following him? And uh, Egypt will not follow him at first, and he'll conquer Egypt, and they'll follow. Uh, but if, So, there's going to be a lot of people that won't. But there will be an enormous amount of people that see him as their messianic figure that is going to bring priests to the world, I believe, because of that treaty with Israel, that Israel will look at him favorably at first until the middle point. And uh, so, he's a likable figure until the middle. Then he becomes, I believe, possessed with a demonic spirit uh, that is extreme and is ancient and will demand to be worshipped, and a lot of things will change in the middle of the tribulation. But, uh, so, I believe there will be a a false Christianity during the tribulation that will follow him. They will love him in everything that he does, and because he accepts all religions at that point, um, for a good reason, and uh, receives the accolades not only of Islam, but of Christianity, false Christianity, I would say, during the tribulation, and other faiths in the earth. So, he's a well-liked figure, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, almost Hindu. Very thing. Yeah. Almost a Hindu. I've always, when I read the scriptures, I always have wondered if he'll be a Hindu, because they so openly accept all the others in. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he will... I believe he'll be born Muslim, but will have such a variety of being lived in certain places and different places that he accepts all religion. We're seeing a movement right now that happened last year that's called Chrislam. Have you ever seen anything about Chrislam? Mm -mm. Chrislam is, was coined by a African pastor who wanted to mix Christianity with Islam, and it kind of caught on. And we've seen this happen with Catholicism and other places. Yeah, the Pope went on a tour. Pope went on a tour. He, they built a uh, uh, three 
uh, a synagogue, a church, and a mosque, and in one place, and and has ordained that as like a peace for the world kind of a thing, and it's mm. really catching on. And we're talking about Muslims are very happy about this, and so I, you know, I think that he will champion a lot of religions, not just not just uh, Islam or Christianity. Interesting. That would the rapture would usher that in pretty quickly. Yes, making yeah. someone come yeah. to the top of the world. Yep, mm. and I believe Second Thessalonians two mentions that that which is is withholding right now until it's out of the way, uh, then the Antichrist can't be revealed. Mm -hmm. So, I believe will be taken out of the way. And uh, think about it: millions of Christians disappear out just in America alone, out of our Senate and our Congress, and and all of our state governments and all of the places where we're leaders. Think about the void that that's going to create for leadership, and uh, people are going to need something to happen very quickly. And I believe he steps in very quickly uh, in that sense. Mm -hmm. Well, and millions of Christians that are gone, but also millions of Christians that are still here. That would confuse the world. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you'll see, you'll see pastors stand up and say, that wasn't the rapture. I'm still here. I was my aliens. congregation's still here and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I believe it. And you'll see people whose half their member family members are there, and they've never, you know, they grew up in church, they did the church thing, but never confessed them and never made that personal decision. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I was just sharing earlier, I was listening to a great story um, book, um, Like a River by uh, Ranger Smith, and he grew up in church, did a, did a daily devotional as a country artist, but it wasn't until going through tragedy and a lot of different things in his life that he hit rock bottom uh, that he realized if he had died, he would not have gone to, to heaven. He'd yeah. never, you know, even though he made a confession as a kid and done all the right things, he was not saved. He had not been changed. He had not, he was still on the self-help yeah. tour, you know, type of thing. And, and uh, you and know, so. the, the scripture says, there's one scripture says, Lord, and at the end he's saying, um, they said, Lord, haven't we done these things? We we cast out devils in your name. We did this. We did that. We did that. And um, another verse says that in the last days, there'll be false Christs. And I thought of that one time. I thought, well, we're called Christians, Christians, which means the anointed one. And, and so, we follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. We've given our heart to him. But there are those who are sitting in our churches today that believe in Jesus, but have never been transformed by Jesus. Mm. So, therefore, he can truly say, depart from me, I never knew you. But, Lord, didn't we do this? See, they even call him Lord, mm. but they never knew him. There's a difference. Mm. And to me, that is our commission today, is to tell the gospel so that people realize I don't just call myself a Christian. I am a Christian. I am born again. I've I received Him, and I've been forgiven of my sins. Makes a difference. That, that's a big. That's a big sentence. Talking to God. Didn't I do? Yeah. Didn't we do? Yeah. No, you you can do nothing apart from Christ. So the thought is, thank you, Lord, for doing it. Like yes, you you He did it. Yeah. So their first instinct is to say, did I did. I do something? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and they're trying to justify themselves as Christians in front of Christ. And he's saying, I don't know who you are. But I mean, yeah, you were in church. Yeah, you said you were a Christian. Yeah, you you lived a certain life because you believed to do that. But I never knew you. Hmm. That's, boy, can you imagine standing before the Lord and him saying that to us? You know, and to me, that's the juxtaposition of prophecy is to teach the gospel till he comes and and to know that there is a future that's been planned out for us, and we don't have to to worry about it because he's in control of it. I had I saw I always have thought that Revelation and Daniel, you know, when we talk about end times, was just a, as believers, one of the most things that we can take from it has always been that we should have an urgency to share Christ with people. Absolutely, like it should quicken our heart to know that there's going to be an end time where there won't be any more decisions. So, yeah. and and Jesus said the harvest is plentiful. It's mm -hmm. laborers are for you. So I've always felt like our call as, as true believers is just to try to live out and share the gospel as much as we can and not worry about 
the, the, the minute details as much as, you know, all that's fun. I think there's good knowledge in that, and it definitely gives you security in knowing that he has, has it all planned. But I think the ultimate goal in my heart has always been that I just need to make sure that I'm doing everything I can because tomorrow may not be promised. Absolutely. Tomorrow could be the rapture. Yep. yep. So, please, you know, when, <laughs> <laughs> so when you think about it, I, I saw a video one time where I, I was up in uh, Michi- or Maryland at the time, and uh, they were, it was a conference about Christians. And it was in a universalist church and a, the, the whole thing. But it was, did you know that Christians believe that their Messiah is going to come back and rule the world with an iron fist? And that he, all of these other processes are going to have to stop. And it was a fearful talk about Christianity having a future mm. where the king will come and rule the world. And 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 so you wonder why they call us radicals is because we believe that we believe that Jesus will come back one day and rule for a thousand years in the earth. And people say, "Oh, that's old fashioned." Where's that in the Bible? Well, it's found in Revelation, and it's you know, and it's found in where in Matthew twenty four and twenty five where Jesus teaches those things, Luke twenty one, and so he's coming back. But when I saw that, I thought, "Oh, there's people out there that." think what we believe is so far-fetched that that it's that it's not even congruent with christianity any longer they believe a different viewpoint of that absolutely to be fair it is very sci-fi yeah yeah i mean yeah. we're gonna have people with spiritual bodies on earth and earthly bodies on earth and yeah. there's gonna be christ but there's gonna be nations there's gonna be there's angels and demons there's there's a lot of sci-fi stuff in there it is <laughs> it is I wish they'd have a movie that actually taught it properly, and I'd, I'd enjoy it. I have such a, I'm a big sci-fi fan, so I love all that stuff. But, you know, to, to find something that comes close. I saw in a Marvel movie one time, I don't remember if it was in game or one of them, is where a massive amount of angelic-looking beings were coming down to the earth. And I thought, oh, that looks cool. I mean, if somebody could capture that, that's a, a viewpoint that, now, of course, it was another group, but uh, to think when we come back with Christ in Revelation 19, what it's going to look like to the earth and what people are going to see, it's going to be massive. It's going to be something that, you know, um, the Bible says in the last days, men's hearts would fail for fear. And we're we're in a time where people are fearful about everything, and it's causing um, anxiety in the earth. But, you know, when you read Revelation, the Bible says it's it was written to be understood and to be a blessing to those who read it. Not a curse, not a fearful thing, but a blessing. And so, um, I tell my wife this all the time, let's just have fun with it. Why fret the certain things? We just need to enjoy life. And, and when we read it, just believe it and know that God has a plan and it changes our lives because of it, you know. I saw a lot of people say because of it, just explaining it. Well, you're also, I believe, throwing, I think, throwing some seed way up in the air so that when the ap- the rapture happens, it, it can fall on people. And yeah. Things yeah, happen. those who are saved after the rapture and realize that they weren't saved, that those things that they heard were true, they'll recognize what it is for what it is. So, that you comes know? back to this book. Mm-hmm. Joy said to me years ago, she said, I believe... The things that you're you're writing and putting on our on our uh, website that people during the tribulation are going to be reading those and getting saved. Um, the the idea of this really is for those people. Mm. It's for us to study it through, but it's for those who are in the middle of it to know how to deal with it. My book on the rapture of the church teaches a lot of different things that they need to understand during that time period. So. Uh, praise the Lord. If that's true, if they're reading it and studying it, all of it's free on the web. It just they can listen to all the lessons for free. Look at the all this is is there for free, even though you can purchase it online. But um, that's my heart, man to mm. to just teach and and try to lay it as clearly as possible as I can. You know, for people. There's a it. there's a line in Revelation that, that kind of brought me to thinking about it. Is the uh, says about the mark the name or the number of the beast Mm -hmm. and it says let the reader understand it's like i think that little insert is like he it's like i know you're reading this yeah during 
all this. Right. It's kind of like, I know you're reading this now. Yeah. Let yeah. the reader understand. Yeah. And then the reader will understand because it, they'll be in the midst. They will at that point. Yes. Lots of details about that. I couldn't write all of that in there. I did. That's for the next book, right? You got it. Part two. Yeah. I got to take another area. We were running out of time for another book. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Don't know if there'll be a part two, but there are some new things that have come out concerning the mark. And I'm. uh, What do you think about this? About what? Mark. Um, Oh, you mean. 6.6 angles, six. There are are a lot of. well, you know, I'm I'm not superstitious, so there are a lot of things we could be superstitious about. I think religious history has a lot of problems and a lot of things that they've taken on to be um, out of whack with true Christianity. Um, there's something there. Um, there's a piece about this big <laughs> that was thrown out. There was a there's a city where they threw a bunch of books out and burnt them and just used them as trash. Well, along came archaeologists and found all of this trash and his pieces of, of scripture and other books and all kinds of neat stuff. Well, in one of those um, is found, in of course, the Vaticanus uh, Recepticus, or one of the ones that the Vatican has also has uh, details about that. So, people are now seeing the mark is not necessarily 666, it could be 616, and I think there's another one too. Um, but when I looked at it, there's one person who described it. Boy, I don't even really want to talk because it's not even in the book. <laughs> but one person described it as being a mark. And if it's read properly, it's the same thing that's put on Islam on people mm. on their foreheads. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's no, not 666, six, six, yeah. but it's that. Hamas. Yes. It's the symbol they use. It is the symbol that they use. The three, the three prong. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's a sideways little stink. So I'm leaning that direction mm-hmm. as far as what the mark is. It's the mark of the beast, and the beast being not only the Antichrist, but his system of thinking. And so um, I believe at the beginning of the tribulation will be the ten kings that join together uh, to take over Europe, specifically in the Middle East, and they'll use that mark at first. Um, if it becomes a literal 666, I'd be surprised, to be honest yeah. with you. Um, so, that mark, um, you have to t- look that up. I mean, mm-hmm. Chuck Missler just, well, he did a thing in his in his um, teaching on Ezekiel, and uh, he brought it out, and I thought, hmm, and he got it from somebody else, and he was doing the same thing, going, hmm, this is, if this is true, but when you see the actual, the one of the oldest Bible's known, and of course, it's a piece of mm-hmm. trash. Mm-hmm. They placed, just put them all together as revelation. <laughs> and and that mark, let him that reads this understand what this mark is. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe one day they'll see it and understand it. Uh, but there's so much that is was mysterious from the you know early centuries, and now we're seeing it as we open the Word. We see things just come to life and be able to understand them in a much better light, I think. Yeah. And, you know, so... That's good. That's good. So, from the book, what can people expect if they if they're reading this book and they're trying to understand who this uh, Antichrist is? What are some of the key things you think they'll take away from it? Um, I I honestly believe he's from a specific area uh, in the Middle East, and so maybe that um, he if you follow Daniel, Daniel talks about the fourth kingdom being, and we believe to be Rome that he will have some connection with with the Roman Empire or a version of the Roman Empire, uh, that these ten kings will also have that same relationship. Uh, I think Perry Stone said that he believed that five were European, five were Islamic, so that they wouldn't mix. It'd be like iron and clay that would not mix. Um, that this 11th person that rises up will be insignificant at first, probably a prince or a governor or something of one of these countries, uh, I, I would assume a prince out of, of uh, Iraq is my opinion. Um, there is a revival of one of the old kingdoms. That's something I, I feel strongly about after studying the connection between Daniel and, and uh, Revelation, and that it was a kingdom that existed before John, so it had to be one of the five uh, that were mentioned. Um, and these kingdoms are kingdoms that opposed Israel. There are, you know, China is not mentioned, 
that was a kingdom that actually existed uh, before John and during the time of John. But um, the five that that ruled over Israel be the Assyrian, the Egyptian, the uh, Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, and then the Roman. Mm-hmm. And so, it, it, John said it's, it was one that was. So, I believe it's a revival of one of the first five. And uh, that's something that I, I think I, I felt that I, I dug out uh, when I studied this out. The fact that um, at first he's, he's a normal person or he seems to be a very charismatic and normal person. So, there are attributes that we find about him in Scripture in that vein. And then after he changes, we see a lot more attributes that are evil. And, and it's why Daniel um, taught about a man that would rise up in the third kingdom of Daniel, which would be the uh, Grecian Empire. Antiochus Epiphanes, and he's likened to the Antichrist. So there's some lot of similarity between him and the Antichrist. So he, he brings like Marvel movies to life, right? I mean, he even shows people that he is God by bringing fire down from heaven. Yes, whatever that looks like. The false prophet, he'll do the same miracles. Yeah, and make an image come alive. There's lots of lots of science fiction there. I'm telling you, you know, people stray away from miracles because they know in the end times there's going to be miracles and they're going to be false things. And so a lot of people say, "Oh, we don't we don't want to deal with miracles today because," but you know we don't throw out uh, Christianity because there's a false Christ coming. You know, I mean we know there is, but we we hold to the truth in what Christ did and what He does in the earth today. So you know, there's lots of lots of crazy stuff that's going to happen during that time. So. I learned a lot, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. studying through. There's a lot of details and a lot of a lot of things. Uh, I did differ from Harry, from his premise on those seven. He had his viewpoint of the seven that uh, Revelation talks about. And just remember, there's seven heads, ten kings. So, those seven heads, what do they represent in Revelation? So, I go into a lot of detail on that and explain those things. So A little different view there. Yeah. So, here's a quick fun question for you. I like fun questions. Yeah. That was a good overview. Yeah, that was a great overview. So, what do you think of uh, the two prophets that come through Wailing Wall are? Oh, they come Lord. back. And uh, we, uh, is it Abraham was, and Elijah? Well, it's obviously Elijah. Okay. I think most people agree that it's Elijah. The other one, uh, some believe, is Moses because of the miracles that are being done. Very similar to what Moses did. He also was in the Mount of Transfiguration. Right. Right? With Elijah. Some people say, well, it has to be people who have not died because they're going to be killed in the streets of Jerusalem. So, they believe it's Enoch right? Elijah. I'm in the middle of that. I'm, I don't necessarily say it has to be um, either, but I, I kind of believe Elijah is one of them. Um, I'm, I'm open for either Moses or Enoch. I was just curious, yeah, because those are the two major reviews and always, yeah. well, they were dogmatic. The devil was fighting over the mo- body, body of Moses. Yeah, yep. yep. body of Moses. do that. Right. Why would he contend for the body of Moses? Yeah. yeah. So, Moses would have to be resurrected, right, to be that man, and then he would have to die again, uh, and Elijah, Elijah has not died yet, so where is he at? And so, he'll die on that day when… when so, if that happens, then Enoch becomes the only person in history of man to not die, or Jesus came. If it isn't Enoch, yeah, yeah. you're right. It yeah. is appointed once for man to die, and yeah. after that is the judgment. Now, what if you're raptured? Well, I've died to my fleshy body. <laughs> yeah, but that's a, you know what I'm saying? That's I, know, not, I know what you're saying. That's you're not saying. physical death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't die physically when yeah. he raptures us. We are transformed physically. So, we, there's going to be a host of people that have not died or have not will not have seen death, other than the spiritual viewpoint that you just said. I agree with you. So, so it doesn't mean you have to have Enoch there. Yeah, I know. I was just curious because it would make a lot of sense, but I also think it makes a lot of sense. I always thought it was Enoch until I had a close friend say, look, I think it's Moses. I'm like, why do you think it's Moses? You, you, the you, 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 the battle for, for the body with Satan. Those are, those are very convincing arguments. It's, you know, and I think it's great that he doesn't tell us. Yeah. I love the fact that the revelation is like, yeah, yeah, I could tell you. I'm Jesus. I could tell you, but I'm not going to let you know. Yeah, I'm going to let you guys have a little fun with that one until you until it and happens. And there's other mysteries out there too. But I think a lot of the scripture, if we really studied it out properly, lay it out, write it down. This means and and just and then put it together. It becomes a puzzle to us. 
a lot of it isn't very easy to interpret. But we we get so many viewpoints and so many things, and we and we hang on to those viewpoints and say, "Oh, I, that's what I learned since I was ten years old. I know that I'm not changing my viewpoint." Well, I've changed a lot of my viewpoints when I came to Scripture. I'm like, "Oh, oh, I didn't realize that's how that worked," and it's laid so much to rest for me um, in understanding, yeah, especially the end times. So I'm, I'm happy about that at least. Yeah, I would agree with you that you know you. Part of it, too, is it takes time to, to delve into different areas of, of Scripture. Yeah. And uh, as you do, you study, the, hopefully you're studying Greek and Hebrew, and you're studying historical context, and, you know, letting the Bible uh, interpret the Bible. And when you start doing all those type of things, all of a sudden, some of those things that seem controversial to yourself or you you know you start to really realize they, they really get fleshed out very well we can overcomplicate things absolutely like for example pre-tribulation i think it's fairly obvious i don't think for the reasons people bring up but if there wasn't a pre-tribulation rapture then what is the purpose of the hundred and forty four thousand? absolutely right yeah, absolutely. So, like, if we're here, the, they don't need to be going around the world preaching. Yes. Like, we'll, we'll so, take care of my that. My opinion, and I bring it out here in, in Daniel 9, 27, there is a future time to finish the transgression. It says there in Daniel 9. Jacob's trouble. It's got to be yeah, completed. and it is Jacob's trouble, and it's seven years. It's one last week of years for their judgment. Mm -hmm. Now, that's sad to say, but what does that say? When the church is taken out, our dispensation is stopped. Then the finishing of Israel happens, and then we come together during the millennial reign. And according to Ephesians uh, one ten, I believe, uh, don't quote me on that. I'm trying to remember where it is, where it says, "When all things are fulfilled and all dispensations, then we all come together in one in Christ." And um, that's a cool thing to know that Christ is is Lord of both Israel and the church. And he has a plan for Israel too, and it needs to be finished. And so that seven years is coming, and I, we don't have to have any part of it. Mm -mm. You know, so yeah. and it's got to. I, I think it has to be very soon, just because of the the, the all these things will the scripture about all these things will be fulfilled, and and this generation shall surely see it. Well, somebody's going to say, well, you know. Uh, John Calvin believed that it was soon. So did Luther, and so did all of the folks that have been preaching the gospel. And you know what? John even believed it would be soon, and yet it's been 2,000 years to finish his prophecy. Um, Jesus has not come back yet and ruled the world. You know? Well, there so was never people wanna, Israel. Right. So, people want to cut and say, well, then it's all, we need to reinterpret how this is. And and maybe it all finished in 70 AD in Revelation. But see, Revelation was written after 70 AD, not before. It's very, very well proven that it was written in the 90s. And so, if it was written after all of the stuff that people are saying it was supposed to be written about, that doesn't make sense. Um, but there are elements uh, in Daniel that definitely have already been fulfilled. So, you have to weed all of that stuff out. And when you look at it, you see the differences. Yes, I do believe Jesus is coming soon. I believe that no time on earth has been this drastic as we see today. I believe there have been uh, world wars where people talked about, oh, Jesus is coming, Ni you know, what was 19... Well, so there's a second war, war works, you know, first some people would have believed... talking about it because Israel was starting to come back into the land, and, and then second world war, and after they came back to Israel, and all of that stuff, people are like heightened, oh... The fig tree is blooming now. We're we're into the last days, and and so yes, all of these things are compounding. But think about in the last year, what we have seen in the last year in the world has not been ever in the world's history. Uh, just the lining up of the nations and the things that are being said, the world currencies, the whole, uh, just the slip up that even uh, who's who's now the king of England. What's his name, Charles? Oh yeah. What he said about, he's, yeah, he said in a speech before he was made king, when we when he takes over, mm -hmm. he slipped up he's and got said trillions. a phrase that was people are like, what 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 did he say? What what's he talking about? Because they're all thinking about how they're going to fix the world, and they're ready to hand it over to a person who can take charge. Um, that's that's weird. How will America land in that? Have you ever thought about that? Oh yeah, who who hasn't? 
Yeah, well, so they believed that America would probably not fall under the Antichrist. And um, in, in his, you know, finished stake in his, his stake annotated Bible. And I thought, oh, that could be true if other countries that are near near him would not fall under him. Couldn't other nations not fall under line but the bible says that he'll have control of the world through economics so in that sense he will have some control over america if all the christians are gone why wouldn't he have even more control because they would easily fall for a trick or a somebody who offers a peace and freedom um when they say peace and safety mm -hmm. when they say they're saying it now. They're screaming, we've got to have peace. We've got to have safety. Uh, then sudden destruction comes upon them. So, um, Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass in Matthew 24, and Luke 21 is where he said there, look up for your redemption draws night. When you see them begin, not at the end, he said, when you see them. And then he said at the end of that chapter, he says, he says pray that you be found worthy to escape all of mm -hmm. these things and to stand before the son of man mm. so it wasn't just talking about escaping in the earth and hiding that's what a lot of people preach today in the tribulation the christians are going to hide out bunkers. and we're going to be okay it doesn't say that because there are christians who will die for their faith during the tribulation period who are born again during the tribulation but jesus says pray that you be found worthy to escape get out of it, and to stand before the Son of Man. The only way that works is the rapture of the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot. Um, I love teaching on the rapture because people are so confused about different verses. What does this mean? What's that mean? And you have to wade through all of that and, and really understand uh, how that works. Where, oh. where did Jesus teach the rapture of the church? First, where did he mm -hmm. teach it? it? Well, he taught it... Uh, Kind of in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, but he really only touched on it. That was for Israel. You'll see Luke, Luke is a different sermon. It was not the Sermon on the Mount. One is in the synagogue and the other is the Sermon on the Mount. People put them together and try to, oh, these are, these are one sermon. It's two different sermons. In Luke 21, he was, Luke went back and said, wait a minute, Matthew talked about the end times, what's going to happen at the end, but what about that sermon that Jesus preached in the synagogue when they asked him similar questions? There were some very specifics that weren't in Matthew. Luke wrote them down. Mm. He said, when you see Jerusalem compassed about with armies, when they begin to surround Jerusalem and take Israel, beware, get out, leave, because it will be too late if you stay. He was talking about 70 AD there very clearly about 70 AD. So, people like to put the rapture in that set of verses, and it does not fit. It's wrong. But you got to know your history. People just read the Bible and don't know their history, and it becomes really a, wow, it becomes a mess really trying to wade through some of that stuff. Context is king. Yeah. Context. Well, and I, and I think the other part is, is understanding, I, I still talk to people who don't understand that Daniel and Revelation mm -hmm. are, 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 you know, looking towards the same thing yeah. and presenting different parts of the same thing. And, but, but just as you said, some of Daniel have been fulfilled. And, and so that gets a little, I think, uh, confusing to people when they, when they don't have a good, uh, the his the biblical. problem is the history. And if, and Daniel teaches history, it's future for him, but it, it is past for us and past for Jesus. Now, so Daniel talks about the history of, the, the Median Persians, which were going to come in after Babylon. The king of Babylon says he sees, saw a dream, and he's the head, the golden head. You know, he likes that. You know, he's the head. But then there's the, the chest and the arms and the, the thighs and the legs and the toes. And, but still, he's the head. And that's what matters because he's the most precious of all. The next metal becomes stronger. The next metal becomes stronger. The next metal becomes stronger. And there are different nations that will take over and control Israel. And Daniel's seeing it for a future of Israel, but he tells the king, this is what's going to happen. Christ is going to come and destroy all of you guys. Now, who, how would that make you happy? But the king was happy to know the interpretation. Well, then you go on and Daniel teaches and, and other visions that God gives him about the Persians. And then he talks about Cyrus the Great. And he talks about later, um, who is it, uh, the Greek... Uh, uh, 
king. Alexander? Alexander the Great. So that's all in Daniel. There's very specific mm -hmm. history. And then when Alexander it's split. Broke into four winds. Four wings, yeah. So then who comes out of that about 400 years later was Antiochus Epiphanes. Mm -hmm. So then he's talking about him. He covers an enormous span. And, but then what, what says there'll be 10 kings who rise up in that fourth kingdom, and there's two, at least two verses, one in Revelation, one in Daniel, says, in the time of these kings, Christ will come and take over. Mm -hmm. Now, if we're a preterist, we think, oh, we got to line up those kings in the past. Who are those kings? Blah, blah, blah. And they come to the, the 11th king as being um, out of the emperors, um, one of the worst emperors that was. And they try to say, he fulfilled the little horn. He fulfilled, you know, in a past way. The problem is this. Um, Jesus looked at, there's a lot of people trying to discredit Daniel and Revelation, even in the early church. But Daniel, they're saying, um, well, that's, that he, it was written by different people and it was Suedo Daniel. It was somebody that was written after Daniel died. Now, how can anybody know the history like that? Well, God does, and he knew it before it happened. But Jesus pointed back to Daniel and said, when you see this happen, the abomination of desolation, then you know the time is at hand. What was that abomination that Daniel talked about? He said, the Antichrist would go in and desecrate the temple. You say, well, didn't Antiochus do the same thing? Mm, kind of. But he didn't go in and sit on the seat, the mercy seat, which is what Second Thessalonians 2 says he'll do. So, what did he do? He desecrated it. We have, um, is it Hanukkah? No, Hanukkah. I believe it's Hanukkah because of the, the rededication yes. of the temple. Yes, right? yes, Hanukkah. yes. So, that all became a part of our history because of Antiochus Epiphanes desecrating the temple, sacrificing a pig on the altar. Mm. Mm -hmm. It took three, not quite three and a half years to restore the temple. So, there's, there's a lot of stuff that you look at it and say, oh, that's about Antiochus. Antiochus was called a little horn too. Did you know that? Mm. So, there's a type there, but then after that, the angel says, let me tell you, this is for the end, the end of the end of days. And then he talks about a little horn. So, why did, was so much pointed out about Alexander the Great and Antiochus? Why? Because there's a connection between those guys and the Antichrist. And there's a type in those guys. Um, but Antiochus didn't fulfill it because Jesus didn't come back, take over the world. You see what I'm saying? So, they have, to, if you believe in a already fulfilled view of the Revelation and Daniel, then you have to believe that Jesus came back and took over. And so, they come up with a spiritualized version of that being that we're in the millennial uh, already and that the church is Christ ruling in the earth. Where, where, where's the history that he came and exactly? <laughs> Our, where's the history that uh, Titus made a seven-year pact with Israel, right. uh, or with the nations? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of missing pieces. You really got to do some, uh, yeah. you know, mental calisthenics to get it's around. Fun to talk with people because I start opening up scripture, and they're like, uh, uh, "Oh, uh, I said, see, that's pretty literal, isn't it? Yeah, yeah." I said, "Where is that in your teaching? Where is that in what you believe?" And they begin to kind of, you know, break down and <laughs> like, have fun with it, you know. Yeah. But it's okay, because I understand there can be a lot of confusion reading, and you've just got to lay it down and see it clearly with history and find your pieces properly, you know. Absolutely. Sorry for being so long-winded, but no, we love it. Why, why are you sorry? Yeah, that's yeah. why we have you. You're our guest. We want to hear you talk. We want to hear about your book. We want to hear about your thoughts. and. Where, you know, what people people who are listening in on this, hopefully this is piquing your interest and they're going, hey, I really would like to get a better biblical view of what's going on with the Antichrist and end times. And if they do, Larry, what can they buy? Uh, well, on Amazon, <laughs> the book is available there. It took me a year to get this thing up and completely finish the way I would like it to look. And um, it took two years to write, so... It's up, I think, for eighteen ninety nine. I believe is what it is on Amazon. If you want a bunch of them, get in touch with me. Uh, joyful, joyful harvest seven 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 at Gmail, and then I can get you a bulk discount on those. I don't believe you can get a bulk discount with Amazon, um, but I can get you a better price if you're buying a bunch of them. 
Okay. Um, so, and our website, you can get all of the materials that I've taught. And then I'm, I've got a whole year's worth of stuff that's going up in a few weeks uh, that I was so far behind. And these are all videos in the last 10 years and teachings. All of the lessons are there for free. All of everything you can pull down. And that's on uh, joyfulhm.org. That's joyfulharvestministries.org. So it's joyfulhm.org. All right. Make sure I, you get that to me. The other thing I was going to say, I showed them this book because this is this is like the, a little bit bigger version. So that if somebody needs to get a little Big bit bigger print, print, a little bit bigger yeah. uh, version, um, you have these available, but they're not on Amazon. They'll have to reach out to you to get the, to get those copies. Yep. So yeah. make sure you guys are, are checking it out. Larry, thanks for being here today and for a great discussion on on this. And uh, we'll have to get you back on. We can, I can go on this. Yeah, we couldn't we couldn't give away all your detailed notes. Yes, yeah, it's hard. You got to read the book to Jeez. get those things exactly. Well, and, and people need to highlight and have their own notes so that way they can make it their own, right? Like, yeah, hearing things and just going, "I well, I believe that." That that doesn't really make it your own. And but if you spend time reading God's word, take this book with God's word. And sit down and go through it and see if it lines up. And if it does, now you can you can go, okay, I'm going to own that belief. Yeah. And uh, One of the things that I do in the book, you notice a lot of people don't print the scripture in their books because it fattens the book. But in, in this one, I printed every scripture I talk about. Oh, good. So they're all there. Some of them are underlined and highlighted to the point where I want people to really get what's being said there. And so, I'll, I'll underline some of the verse. And on purpose, I don't change it. If I do anything with my words, I put it not bolded, and it put and I put LB in front of it so that people don't misunderstand that that's not scripture. So, um, you know, it's there to study to understand things better and to get a better understanding. So, um, so we can know who the Antichrist is and understand where. You know what's gonna what's gonna be happening, and hopefully take some confusion out because the lost world finds it in, in, interesting as well. And so they everybody's got a different twist on yeah. end times. You and then you've got the the movie version and some of the stuff. You know, over the years, there's been many many popular whether it be movies like uh, Left Behind, mm -hmm. um, or if it's books like uh, you're probably the same. You're a little older, but but around the same time of Hal Lindsey's Late Great Planet Earth. Yeah. All those things from like the 60s and 70s that were coming out about end times. And it all had good stuff, but they didn't go detailed. They, they just kind of said, this is what, what, what's going to happen. And people just kind of took it. And they never really broke it down. And that's why there's a lot of different beliefs. You got pre, mid, trib. You've got uh, uh, dispensationalism. You've got um, preterism. I mean, there's all these different isms and different thought ideologies yep. and uh, that come out of confusion, right? And if people would just spend time in God's Word, just like you said earlier, and if you just kind of rationalize and look at it, uh, you'll come to, you know, probably to the right conclusion yeah. uh, by just spending time reading and getting in God's Word and, and grabbing a book like this that goes through, as you said, line by line, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and breaks it all down. Um, and I love the fact you're taking from Daniel and Revelation. You're not focused on one or the other because I think that can be dangerous too that, you know, you're pulling from all of Scripture because I've seen that too. I've seen them where they just, you know, they basically don't don't deal with Daniel. They deal with just Revelation. Or I've seen it where they just do it on Babylon and, and right. Daniel and they forget Revelation and, and all those things. I mean, they're all... These are together, and, and, and I'm and Jesus is teaching. Seeing some things that are um, symbolism, but I'm I'm a literalist, so I, I if it's able to be seen literally, then I'm going to see it that way first. And you know, when you talk about the uh, the dragon in Revelation 12, with with uh, seven heads and ten crowns and these kind of things, and you see that. You think, well, that's probably a symbol because it's in a vision of something that's real. And so, you have to understand those things in symbols sometimes. But where it's literal, take it literal. Uh, you know, don't try to spiritualize something that you don't need to be spiritualizing. And that was the problem with the early church. There was such, in the 300s and 400s, there was such a push to spiritualize everything. They were trying to get rid of the book of Revelation during that time, too, because it was so hard to understand and they believed that it was already fulfilled anyway, so get rid of it. We don't need to talk about it. And then 
Daniel, they still didn't know what to do with Daniel and some of the other books that, you know, it, what about, what, what about say, uh, yeah. Ezekiel and Jeremiah's, all of those prophecies, how do you deal? So, there's a whole system of theology that says that stuff isn't going to be feel, fulfilled any longer because Israel lost its place and the church has replaced Israel. So, we don't need to even study that stuff anymore. Ah, uh, that's sad, you know, to throw out half of your Bible uh, because you don't believe it's to be fulfilled. So. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here. Folks, thank you for listening and checking us out. And make sure you check out the uh, website. We'll put all that in uh, the show notes and links and all that good stuff. So check that all out. And uh, thank you for those that support us um, and this podcast, uh, Resource One. You can give Andy and his team a call at uh, 636-458-1798. Chris at CS Design and their folks at 573-436-3717 and Jeff Earhart for any of your insurance needs. Um, they're at State Farm at 314-821-JEFF or 5333. So give those guys a holler. We'll also have their stuff in the show notes so you can uh, get to any of those guys quickly. And we appreciate uh, your uh, listening in and we'll catch you next episode. Thank you, guys. say